We like to start these webinars uh, welcoming those new to Artwork Archive, welcome, as well as those that uh, utilize Artwork Archive for their online art collection management system, welcome back, and we hope this is a helpful resource for you utilizing the platform. For those that are new to Artwork Archive, we are an online art collection management system based here in Denver, and we work with artists, collectors, and art organizations all over the world to help them digitize, organize, manage, and share their artwork and collections. And I am so lucky to work with incredible academic institutions like Davidson College and New Mexico State University, our panelists today, who will be joining us. A few housekeeping items. I know we've all been on Zoom webinars before, but just like to go through it anyways. This webinar is being recorded. And we typically share out the recording and the slides via email the next day. This will actually be delayed because my colleagues are on vacation <laughs> for the, today and tomorrow. So you'll be receiving the slides and the recording next week uh, via email. We have saved time at the end of the presentation for your questions. So please submit those via the Q&A icon down at the bottom. If you are an, on an iPad, you may have to hit the three dots to pull that up. Um, feel free to use chat to introduce yourself, uh, to chat amongst the, the other attendees. And if you have any technology questions um, or issues with the webinar, that's a great place to send them. Uh, would love the actual questions about the content to come into Q&A though, so we can have it in one centralized place to answer at the end of the presentation. If you need uh, access to captioning, we do have that. You can click live transcript script at the bottom. It's a but on your um, bottom panel. Uh, so you click live transcript and then show subtitle and that will show it for you. Um, it's an automated transcript available um, for those on Zoom desktop or Zoom mobile. Um, so if you're using the web browser, um, it may not be viewable. So I'm sorry about that. Here about Here's our interest. Here's us. <laughs> Here your panelists. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my esteemed panel uh, of Courtney and Marissa. I'll introduce myself first uh, since I've been talking. I'm Alicia McNiff Kogelmeyer. I am the head of growth at Artwork Archive. My pronouns are she and her. I am a fair-skinned redhead wearing a blue shirt sitting in my home office with a bookshelf behind me and one of my father's paintings behind me as well. I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. And a little bit about me, I mentioned my dad's painting in the background. I am the daughter of artists, art therapists, and art educators. So the creative process has always been in my blood. And many of my family members um, are within academia. So you are my people. I'm excited to see you all here today. I've worked in the arts since graduating from Middlebury College. And my first job was actually at Middlebury's Art Museum. An expedited version of my CV is that I have run a public art program, uh, curated academic institutions, uh, worked with student artists, visiting artists. I've written a number of art publications and received my master's in public humanities at Brown University. And now I'm grateful to work with academic institutions like you all at Artwork Archive, producing these free educational resources, as well as helping um, our clients on our platform. Uh, so Marissa, do you wanna jump in? You're muted. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about that. Um, my oh. name is Marissa Pascucci. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am the collections and gallery coordinator at Davidson College. I've been here for about a year. Um, before that, um, I was a curator in Florida at the Boca Raton Museum of Art, um, and I've just been working in museums for I know, about 20 some years now, working always with collections and curatorial work. Thank you, Courtney. So I'm Courtney Aldrich. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the collections curator at the University Art Museum at New Mexico State University. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, the genesis of the Southwest Indigenous peoples, including the Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, who established their guardianship on the lands now occupied by New Mexico State University. As the state's land-grant university, we acknowledge and we respect the sovereign Indi Indian nations and Indigenous peoples here. 
Um, I'm the, like I said, I'm the collections curator. I'm pretty brand new at this role. I am a recent um, graduate with my master's in art history from New Mexico State University. Um, and in this position, I, I'm kind of both our collections manager as well as a curator from our permanent collections. Awesome, thank you. And I just have to say before uh, going, going to the next slide, hi, Doug from Middlebury in <laughs> the Middlebury College of Museum of Art is here um, on, on the webinar. So good to see friendly faces. Uh, and hello to those that I know as well. Um, okay, let's get into the agenda. So one of the many things that makes our academic institutions so unique is that we affect and engage with so many different types of audiences, right? Our students, our faculty, our community members, scholars, learning institutions. Uh, but that also means with, you know, um, great reward could also comes great risk. We also have a lot that we are juggling. <laughs> there is a lot of information to share out and to keep consolidated and details to keep on touch keep track of as we are um, fielding inbound and reaching out beyond our walls. So here are the, the communities that we will be speaking to in this presentation, our colleagues, our faculty, the students, scholars, donors, college advancement, loaning institutions, and our local and afar communities. So first things first, the people in-house, your colleagues that you work with at the museum or galleries. So this may be an obvious slide, the slide title being Make Information Accessible, uh, because, but we want to address it because even though it's expected, it sometimes doesn't happen. You could have documents and information strewn across cabinets, files within closets, on various computers. Uh, and so just addressing that it's very helpful to have your information centrally digitized uh, in one database, an online database. So then you can then share it out um, and give others access in, but having it all centralized in one place um, and remembering that it's not just the details about the artwork and their high-res images, but also the documentation. So the uh, donor letters, the treatment plans, um, if it's a contemporary artist, uh, a time-lapse video of them making the work or an interview with them. There's so much uh, rich context that we can provide with our objects uh, to be archived and shared out uh, for years to come. And the other thing is like, we're working with the campus. We have buildings all over the place. Uh, when it's all centrally ac accessible, you also always know where your artwork is. So you don't have to run over to the provost's office to confirm that the, the watercolor truly is hanging above uh, her desk. And I just wanted to show an example. So here we have a screenshot of um, a beautiful work, Children Playing Backstreet Dublin. And I believe, Marissa, this is from, from your collection. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just jump in and just show you an example of what this can look like, because for those that are using Artwork Archive, um, I want it to be a friendly reminder of the fact that you can attach additional files to your object record. Um, so here I am with an Artwork Archive, I'm looking up a piece. Within the past year, we enabled our clients to be able to add video links. So if your videos are on YouTube or Vimeo, you can have the video here. And then that's also publicly accessible if you embed it onto your website or have a public profile. Uh, so make sure to check that out within your object records. But if I scroll down here, I just wanted to call out where you can add those additional files. So a certificate of authenticity, a donor letter. And as you can see, you can download it or you can share it directly out. So to that point of making information accessible. So maybe uh, the donor letter needs to be sent back out to college advancement because they lost their copy, whatever it may be. And then this beautiful screenshot is uh, from Marissa's program at the Van Avery Smith galleries at Davidson College. Uh, and for those that have an art lending program um, or those that aspire to, we wanted to take a moment and talk about some great best practices when coordinating that. 
so we do a program, as it says up there, called Art and Offices, where um, as a perk for staff members, we haven't expanded it to faculty members yet, but for staff members across campuses or across campus, um, they can check out one work from the collection um, to hang in their office. Um, usually we do this on a two year uh, rotating basis. Um, this past time, it's actually people had their work for four years because we didn't obviously do it during the pandemic. Um, but every two years, we recall all the work, look at it, and then send it back out. Um, staff does have the possibility of extending their um, or renewing their, their loan um, as well. But having this centrally located kind of private room, um, faculty can kind of take a look at, see what's available. Um, it's not all 4,000 pieces in our collection. We do kind of max it as um, a certain size, a uh, certain price limit. Um, it, not everything is under glass. Um, we do have some um, non-glazed paintings that are in it um, as well. Um, but it's just really great to have that central location. And also previously, um, for this program and another lending program we have, we would print out, you know, sheets of information on the work for whoever, you know, say they chose that um, Stamos um, print right there. You know, they would get a printout with a little bio and the name and title of the work and a little bit of information about the work if we had it particular to that work. And now I don't have to do that um, because their like loan forms and their email confirmations has the name of the artist in there um, and the title. And if they don't even have the inventory number, they don't need that, but they can go right to the link from our website, search the collection and find that work. Um, so it is really great that they can always have that. And we know that how pieces of paper can always get lost in the shuffle of your office and same with emails. But if they ever want to know about that work, they can always go back and take a look at it and see what else um, that artist um, has in our collection. I love that. And it helps with the carbon footprint, right? Less, less paper. <laughs> less paper. <laughs> and, and to show how dynamic it is, um, private rooms are a very popular tool within Artwork Archive. Other online databases um, may have something. And I want to pause and say, we use our, we're using Artwork Archive for our examples um, because I work at Artwork Archive <laughs> in person. Courtney uses Artwork Archive, and this is our educational webinar. Uh, but if you're using something else and there is something similar, like we hope and encourage that these best practices can be translated to the database that you are using. Um, but it's very easy to create um, a curated body of works that you are sharing to an, um, a particular audience. So in this case, the staff or this, uh, we'll get into private rooms and other use cases, uh, but it's a URL that um, you send to them so then they can view it, they can send you a comment, I like it, but I like uh, I like the abstract works, but the colors just don't really go, do you have something with the different hues, they could favor it and like it so you know this is the work they want, um, they can click in and learn more about the, the artwork and the artist as well. Um, and so just calling out that if you do have an Artwork Archive account, that you can create them right here underneath Artwork within private rooms. Um, and with a few clicks of the button, you decide what information you want to share. There's other ways to share information, which uh, Courtney, or no, no, um, Marissa, the, uh, the inventory report, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance for that. Yeah, so our inventory report we've used quite a bit um, this summer as we've been calling back artworks. Um, so when we put them in the offices, staff offices, there's also common areas in a lot of these buildings. So they're not checked out to a certain person, but they're checked out to the building. So we've been able to do that. Um, and also Davidson College has just transitioned into a new president. And so this up there, you can see in the corner, it says inventory report for president's house. So once the president um, was officially kind of done with her term and moving out of the, the home that they have um, on campus, uh, myself and our director went over there to retrieve our artwork. And they had lots of artwork in their home that wasn't just part of our collection. So it definitely helped to have this very neat, clean, orderly um, inventory with images, sizes, all the information we needed to kind of match up what was ours and coming with us um, and what was not ours. So it um, it helps internally and then also, you know, to send this out um, to people, it definitely looks very, very professional, all ordered images, you know, clearly there 
um, thankfully, yes, you pulled up a shot from that screenshot that has actual images in it. So we don't have everything photographed from our 4,000 objects, but we're getting there. That's true. That's a great reminder. That this is all a process, right? <laughs> this is not um, a fully baked, uh, perfect thing. Um, our collections uh, constantly need care and um, updating and um, editing. So yeah, and I love um, the other thing to note too is, you know, if you had to do this inventory report, um, again, uh, say there's turnover uh, or uh, for the president's office or um, you are um, looking at inventory of works within storage and you know you're running it every year. Uh, within Artwork Archive, for those um, that don't know, you can actually save your reports as templates so that the next time you just update the pieces that are included and it keeps all the information that you want within that report being, you know, inventory number, size, uh, condition, whatever that information be. Thanks. Let me just play this little video. I wanted to give you a little something to enjoy <laughs> while we talk. Um, and so another great thing about digital tools, having a database that is online, um, is that it enables you to collaborate remotely, which we have very, very much learned the past few years, right, with, with COVID. Um, and so what is great is that if you have an online database is that you don't have to rely on being on site or on one computer. Um, you can access information from anywhere and on any device. You're not reliant on the registrar um, holding all of that information and you need to peer over their, their shoulder or ask them to print out a report every time you need something. And to that point, and that way you're not letting the weight fall on that one poor person, uh, especially if you have a small team, you're able to make the most out of your small team and distribute collection knowledge. Also, you'll always be prepared. Uh, so if you are not in the office that day, say you are visiting with a donor um, or you're at a conference, but you need inf information for an insurance broker or you have a press inquiry, you can quickly send out that information from your phone, your tablet, your laptop. Um, and then you can also uh, stay on top of maintenance and conservation if you are working with a contractor conservator who's not necessarily in the office or in storage or with your artworks all the time. A great example at Stanford Children's Health the Hospital, uh, they have a conservator um, who is contract. She has access to the, um, the database, to Artwork Archive, and the conservator um, uploads her treatment plans, uploads her notes, um, and then the curator can see it in real time. But Courtney, I know you had some something to share to this slide. Yeah, so previously to Artwork Archive, um, we were using a database um, that was a program that was downloaded on computers and we only had access to have it on two computers. So especially during COVID, that was a difficulty. Essentially, the one computer was given to me and the other computer was here when I worked in person. And all of that information kind of really was relied on me. And that database was also really clunky and difficult to use. And I know my director sometimes was a little scared to use it to try and find the information if I wasn't there, afraid that she might delete something or that something would, you know, kind of disappear on her. And so especially when I was working as a graduate student because we only had two full-time um, um, employees at that point, they essentially had 20 hours a week that if they had the questions they needed to ask, that was all they really had in terms of for me. And so now um, with Artwork Archive, it's great that um, I'm not the only person that can access this information. If my director needs information, she's able to kind of pull it up on her own um, or um, I can still do it and I can do it a lot quicker. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about um, uh, mentioning not being reliant on, on on site or computer, one of the things that has been life changing for us has been um, in our storage, which is on site and um, very close to my office, but we don't have a computer um, in our storage. And so we do have an iPad and I have my laptop and we've got our phones. So being able to, if I'm in there, quickly look up a piece and be able to find its location um, has been really, really helpful. Instead of trying to either have a printed out sheet where I have the information written on it or having to try and remember if I'm in my office looking and I need to go and look at a piece, try and remember the location instead of being able to take it in there and, uh, you know, quickly look it up. Yeah, and that's great. And that actually reminds me, thank you, Courtney, of um, 
the active care and uh, to our collection and you know say you're walking across campus and you notice that um, um you know a sculpture has some sneaker marks uh because it's sunday morning um you know this way you don't have to walk back to your office to the museum um to make note of that you need to get it cleaned you can just pull up your phone take a photo um, and add that you know conservation need while you're while you're on the go um, because you know, uh, campuses our campuses are sprawling sometimes we have uh, if we're a state university we have sites um, in various towns and so making sure that we're not beholden to to one place so that we can uh, stay on top of everything and storage being a biggie too so that was a great example thanks um, another audience segment our faculty. And so we'll get into that. And, and so, faculty, oh, yeah. faculty that's maybe not always just be art faculty um, as well. So this is one of our um, screenshots. Um, and not all of these kind of categories um, or collections are viewable to the public through kind of some like back facing ones so we kind of make our own little group so we can then share. Um, but one that we did um, with an interesting story to it is called, we just simply titled it Bodies in Medicine. Um, just it had anything to do with, you know, being sick, healthcare, all of that. And um, one of our biology professors was teaching a class um, about COVID-19. And the students were looking at it from various angles. And one of the angles actually happened to be art. So we had this, we didn't want to, direct them one way or the other about artworks for them to choose, but we did show them this collection that we had called Bodies and Medicine. Um, and for the exhibition that the students created from this, um, they actually only chose one or two from that grouping that we had and the other 10 or so works in the exhibition that they created that did end up going up on view on campus, not just a, a virtual one, um, had nothing really to do with bodies or medicine. Um, they were looking at COVID and how it affects them through more the loneliness of the pandemic. And so they were choosing things like we've got a, a hopper um, print that, you know, shows typical hopper style of uh, that sole figure walking down a street lit by just one light um, or an empty staircase that kind of winds up that you don't see where it ends. So they were thinking about it more that way. Um, so it was really interesting to see how a biology student um, approached it. And then, you know, thinking, well, we, you know, there's, there's the art way to approach it. And then there's the other way to approach it. So it's, um, really great for them to also be able to see the collection because a lot of the works that they were choosing were not framed. So they couldn't like just come into storage and see it. So searching it through by keywords um, through this really kind of connected them. And then obviously then the, the faculty member to the collection. Yeah, I love that the engagement opportunity and how we learn from the students, right? Um, and create those discussion points and engagement points um, and giving them access. And it's not just what we feed them or curate for them, um, which is a really great point. And Courtney, I, I believe you had something to share too as well. Yeah, I so this is kind of one of the primary roles in my position is outreach um, when it comes to both our communities and um, scholars and um, students, but really working with faculty here on campus and exposing our collection to them and trying to prioritize um, our collection in terms of it wasn't really accessible before. It was very difficult um, for us to be able to pull together the information in order to show pieces of art to different classes and everything. And so um, now I can have our photography professor reach out to me and say, hey, I would love to show a collection of your black and white photos or um, portrait photos um, to my class. Can you give me a selection of prints? And I can pull, I can kind of call all of those together into a private room, send her the URL. She can favorite the ones that she likes. We can talk about if there are any, um, you know, concerns with the ones that she likes. Otherwise I can pull those for her class and it's just that simple. And it doesn't require having to also go into the storage, um, which is always helpful when it comes to preventative conservation practices. Absolutely. 
and I, um, when I bring my, my own experience to this, I'm thinking one of my favorite classes in undergrad was a Russian history class because I was a history major. Um, and the professor also brought literature. We read Master and Margarita. We talked about art and he had slides. And so thinking of, um, you know, my alma mater's being able, museum being able to have a collection of Russian um, paintings or Russian art or whatever it may be to be able to share with that history professor because it's more than yeah just the the art history or the studio art classes which very much need this as well so engaging them as well and streamlining that um, and the last bullet here we have um, helping faculty create online exhibitions with their students we'll get into the the creation of online exhibitions in a little bit uh, but also giving your faculty uh, tools to like enliven the artworks and give their students, you know, opportunities to to dive into the the content as well. Um, and then Courtney, uh, that's a great example. Yeah, so this was a really fun. Um, this, this is a collection that we were able to at um, the museum. We have two major permanent collections. One is our modern and um, contemporary art collection, and our other is a Mexican retablo collection. Um, and so. We, um, this past semester, worked um, kind of collaboratively with the University of Chicago. We're working towards our upcoming exhibition is going to be guest curated by a professor of art history from the University of Chicago. And so he worked with us to host this class that um, collaboratively included students from UIC, as well as students from New Mexico State University, um, kind of preparing and looking to see what it's like to prepare to curate an exhibition. And so this um, uh, private room being able to share this was really helpful for the students at UIC because they didn't have access to the retablos on hand as we do here. So in terms of knowing what the retablos looked like and being able to kind of um, interact with them in a way, but also really cool um, through this, there was a collection of students there that worked to um, you can see in the bottom right hand corner that there's text um, in the bottom of that piece. Those are ex votos and all of our ex voto collections, um, they're written in Spanish. And so a group of students as part of this um, class also work to translate um, some of our ex votos through this because they were able to access through the high res images through this. And so then they were able to translate and then those translations go into our database and then it becomes more accessible um, to our community through that. I love that. And that reminds me, uh, Lily Museum of Art at University of Nevada, Reno, um, they have presented uh, with us um, and they have a great example where students go into the collection, find artworks, objects to um, research. They conduct their own research and then they upload their research to the, the collection. So remembering that our collection is a living thing that still has room to grow, even if it's an object, you know, from the BC area um, and giving uh, students to the next point, you know, ownership and something to get excited by. And so with that, you know, the importance of empowering our students. Uh, and so bullets here, giving gallery desk attendance tasks in your database. So this screenshot is from the Lily, um, giving your students objects to research and uploading their findings, like I just mentioned. Um, having students create artworks inspired by your collection. So uh, Vivian from the Lily gave a great example of studio art majors researched artworks from the collection using the, the private rooms that they were given. Um, and then they created artworks um, inspired by, um, which was beautiful, and they were displayed together. And then again, as mentioned earlier, encouraging students to produce their own online exhibition. So if it's an art history class and the a curation is a piece of it, um, giving them the tools to do so. Um, and then Marissa, you had a really lovely uh, class that Leah taught that you wanted to speak to. Yes, our uh, gallery director and curator, Leah Newman, co-taught a class with one of our art history professors called um, Challenging Collecting and Exhibition Practices. So students, um, thanks to a very generous grant from a donor, um, took this class, were able to analyze the collection, and not just our collection, but realizing that so many collections are based in, you know, practices of, you know, everybody's collection pretty much is, you know, how much of it is white male artists. Um, and so thinking about how that has, a, has happened for decades and how it affects now what museums are trying to do. So the students were able to really kind of dive deep into our collection, 
think about what is here and what is missing. Um, so they were able to, you know, if you're looking through the collection, we've got 4,000 pieces and not everything, well, most of it, as I said, is photographed, but you can't look at each object. So they were really, really able to look through artwork archive um, based on the keywords that were in there to find works that kind of were outside that, you know, white male canon um, to find works what we have. And then part of this class was then they were able to go to New York for a week to visit with galleries and artists to find works to actually purchase for the collection um, that helped fill those gaps. Uh, so they were able to actually purchase three works, um, find works in our collection that work with those artworks as well to contextualize them and then create an exhibition that we then also um, installed on campus. But if it wasn't for a database that you could really look at and search through that had that capacity to just search by a keyword, not just by like artist gender or ethnicity or life dates, but really kind of, you know, thinking about um, what is being represented in that work um, to, to contextualize it into the exhibition um, was really fabulous. And the three works they chose are great works that will, you know, not only enhance the collection, but enhance teaching across areas. So it's not just, you know, for the art history classes, it's for uh, for kind of studies and um, printmaking and, and letterpress that's here on campus and all kinds of um, historical classes, history classes um, as well. So it really did engage the students in more than that. It really did empower them that they actually made a difference in the collection, that their voices were heard and acted upon. It wasn't just kind of taken in, you know, you know, shoved in a, the, the, the archives of a class, actually something tangible came out of it. Yeah, I love that makes me want to go back and take classes. Again. <laughs> and the other thing is uh, when you mention keywords, um, putting on like my artwork archive hat uh, to those that are in a free trial or using artwork archive tags, we always encourage tags. So those are, that's an open-ended keyword field where it can be, it can be blue. It can be female. It can be, you know, lighthouse if it's a landscape or it can be, you know, an additional acquisition number that you need to keep track of because it's a work on loan. It can be anything um, which then helps right, as you're building out curriculum um, or communicating with scholars, students, faculty to quickly be able to do searches or filters and find, and also giving those tools to those that may not be as knowledgeable about your collection and don't know the 4,000 works um, that are new. It's if a freshman um, conducting a research project. So yeah, giving them those avenues to dive in and learn more. Yeah. And one other point about keywords that's been really been great for us is our interns. So we're, we're a staff of two full-time staff members. Um, and then we've got all of our interns and our interns are not necessarily art students, whether art history or studio art. And one of the main tasks that they do when they are working in the gallery um, at the desk as opposed to in the offices with us is keywording. So, you know, we've got the economics majors, we've got the biology major, majors. Yes, we do have some studio art majors as well, but they are looking at an artwork and just putting every word that they associate with it. So, you know, as art historians, we kind of started, we come to, you know, is it representational? Is it abstract? You know, is it a print? Is it a painting? Is it monochromatic? You know, you, you've got those basic things, um, but then they really kind of get into it with different ideas. And so it really does just open up the collection to so much broader interpretation and, and searches. Yeah, I love that. And that actually um, jumps into to Courtney. Um, I think you were going to discuss uh, MFA students curating their own mini exhibitions. Yeah, so we um, we rely really heavily on our students to be um, both in the museum and in terms of um, interacting with our collection. And <laughs> I know um, because we have a very active MFA program um, that they actively, they use our museum gallery space every um, uh, spring when um, during graduation and everything. And I know during COVID, um, it, it was helpful to be able to kind of have these online exhibitions for their work, but then also for classes. Um, again, I'm able to kind of provide, um, there was a, uh, a class in which the professor was working with our Andy Warhol collection of works. And I was able to um, call together all of our Warhol pieces, provide it to her. And then she was able to provide that to her students who were then able to go through and kind of research the works, look at the works and kind of mini curate these little exhibitions from um, that 
that collection. And it's something that we're hoping to kind of continue growing and possibly expanding by embedding into our website and having it be something that's like a community um, exhibition versus just an internal NMSU exhibition. Yeah, I love that. Actually, uh, uh, the Marjorie Barrick Museum of Art, um, Alicia Kerlin, the executive director, speaks to one of the great things about having digital tools is engaging local curators and community members with the collection. And we may not be able to stand up physical shows uh, for those in our community, but we can be advocates for them um, by standing up smaller um, online shows. And actually that ties in great to our to the next slide, um, which is about making your collection more approachable. So activating scholarship of your collection by bringing it online, giving a students like a tiptoe in before coming, if they've never been into a museum before, they're a little shy, they can do some early research online, um, you know, to have offer a hybrid experience, not to replace the in-person, but to enhance the in-person experience. Um, not to be limited. Uh, so you can embed all of this information that we're talking about your database onto your website, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and that, yeah, it initiates dialogue. So before scheduling those on visit, um, site visits, uh, you can send them information. And right before this presentation, Courtney gave a great example of you only have so much space, right? <laughs> to your point with um, keeping um, impact minimum, uh, or you, uh, pulling out a drawer, you know, not 20 people can't see it, but um, if you have a work that's unframed, but this way you can share out the piece to an intro class that may have hundreds of yeah. students. Um, so with that, I just wanted to show, we've been talking about private rooms as a way to share out information. Um, I mentioned you can also have um, a public profile, meaning your database, uh, your artwork archive database can be uh, made public. You decide what pieces, what information is public. So, you know, maybe acquisition prices is kept private. That's for your back end. Um, but this way you can make it all accessible uh, for people to view. Uh, and so here I'm on the University Art Museum. Um, the collections that we've been talking about, curating the bodies of, of artwork to help people um, navigate and learn more. So if I click into this great poster collection, um, I can see and click in your artists have profiles. So if you're entering that information, then I'm going to click in to Jules. Um, if there was a bio um, attached to her record, you would see that the exhibitions, which um, we'll get into this example a little bit uh, down the road, but I wanted to show to the point of inquiry. Here I am on the Marjorie Barrick Museum of Art. Um, and so they have, you know, it's an installation. They have installation shots, which I can click into and see. But if I'm a student and I'm supposed to research this piece, um, or I'm an interested community member, uh, via the public profile, I can click inquire, send a message, and this will come to you to your artwork archive inbox. Um, and so you can field inquiries and engage with conversations. Um, and this public profile, I mentioned embeds, can be embedded onto your website so that when you do have a new acquisition, um, an MFA uh, student makes a body of artwork and donates it in, uh, when you add it to your database, it will automatically be reflected onto your website. You don't have to worry about IT, webmasters, you don't have to double enter. Um, so really helpful. Um, and I can show that example. Here we have an exhibition embed that Courtney shared. Um, so here we are on their website. And then you are able to embed this exhibition, all the great information. Um, and I'm putting the, the cart before the horse, but actually exhibitions is what I wanted to jump into uh, next. What's great is that um, sometimes exhibitions are up we put a lot of time into preparing them. They're up and then they're down. And then maybe we have like one image installation shot and a brief description on our website. Um, this way, you know, we are sharing uh, so much more information um, for posterity, um, for engagement opportunities that scholars can look into. Um, you know, you can upload videos. It can be a walkthrough. It can be an interview with the, the curator. Um, I'll say it's also really helpful for institutional knowledge in terms of our exhibitions, because I know I have a filing cabinet that I look at every single day of all of our <laughs> exhibitions for the past 20 years. And, you know, 
we have just random mismatch of files and handwritten notes and different things like that that don't really always give all of the information that you would want, maybe the pieces that are in it, the artists that were included in it. We do a lot of um, uh, exhibitions here where artists come in that are not from our permanent collection. And so now being able to have like a, a digital um, photos and, a, and a, um, a history of that on our website. So that way we can really quickly just look it up and we know exactly what pieces were in the exhibition, what artists were a part of it, when the dates were, all of that information. It's all in one place instead of in the filing cabinet. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I was scrolling through an exhibition record. Um, so I've given a presentation in the past, a webinar, and it's on our website, and I'll link to our webinars page about creating online exhibitions for, for access particularly, um, in which we go into this in a little bit more of a, a deep dive, but a really great tool for project management, for an archive, for sharing access out. I mean, it's, it's just, it's rife um, with opportunity. And it makes it um, just research accessible too for you know general public you know searching that artist that artist record is there like the exhibition record and is there so it's not you know sending an email to you know a, a museum that's usually way understaffed can't respond to emails quickly the research is for the general audience um, and and scholars is right there too. Yeah, exactly to the point of connecting with scholars um, outside of your your community, so they don't have to be on site and they can get the information. Um, and then uh, Alicia at Marjorie Berg also says she includes she hyperlinks the the press release. So to that point, uh, she just directs the press to the the exhibition page and all of that information is there. And yeah. I'll say really quick before you move away from that, because um, that exhibition that you were showcasing was one of our MFA exhibitions. And I think that it's really um, beneficial to the students too, right? Like this is a professional representation of their artwork. And, it, and if they are looking to showcase in a gallery um, in the future, like we hope all of our MFA students are going to do, they can share the website and there are interactive photos and detailed shots with information about their, their thesis show, which is I think is really beneficial to them as a, um, as an artist as well. Yeah, I love that you're helping them professionalize, um, right, and giving them the tools, yeah. whether it's studio art or um, art history students that may be interested in being collection managers, right, or work, working within museums, giving them accessible tools um, is really great. Yeah, I love that. And I'm going to go through a few other uh, tools that um, help, uh, you know, connect with students and scholars. This example being from Marjorie Barrick Museum of Art. Part of that public profile, there's also a news section. And so they have students write up um, uh, articles about particular objects. Um, or this was from, um, I believe, a, a volunteer that did some research um, on an object as well. And then it's also a great way to, to share out information if you have a new acquisition or an exhibition coming up. You may already have a blog, but if you don't, then this can serve as your blog um, and be really helpful for you to share out. Speaking of things um, to help share out, QR codes. Um, you know, thanks to the pandemic, QR codes are coming back in, in style. We're used to ordering our lattes with them um, and our cheeseburgers. And now we can add additional context. We're not limited to just that printed label, you know, in our galleries. Um, we can add additional context. So someone can, um, a student can scan this QR code and be brought to the artist website. It can be brought to um, a YouTube video of the artist making the artwork. Or an example that uh, Vivian gave from Lilly Museum of Art, they had these in their um, online catalog, in their catalog, their printed catalog, and the QR code actually went to a video um, speaking to the indigenous cultures of the artist, um, mm -hmm. the artists that were participating in the show. Um, and so just like much more historical, cultural context, because it's not just the creation date and the title and the artist name really um, that we're, we're learning about and engaging with. So you can use these little guys you know, to drive people to your exhibitions, to your website, to elsewhere in the internet because it is um, just an empty field to be entered. So if I just go to show you within Artwork Archive for creating QR reports, if you go to new report, QR code labels, here you can see, you can add a custom link. 
or you can bring them to your public page. You can also set, use them for internal organization. So if works are in storage, you can scan it and see your object records, you know, what's underneath that paper. And then you can use your various filters to find the artworks that you need to create these QR codes, maybe for an exhibition, uh, maybe for a loan. And another great way to share out information is just creating a beautiful portfolio page report from your, um, your artwork archive account um, that you can you know, download and print and leave in the galleries. Uh, you can send this to the professors, to the faculty um, about artworks that they're um, researching in the classroom. And then Courtney, you have an example about a loan. Yeah, so I, I know recently we were um, reached out to by a local museum that requested um, information about an artist in our um, collection, and we only had maybe one or two pieces um, by him, and so it, it seemed that doing something like this was a lot easier and it made more sense than creating a private room with two pieces in it to share with them. So I could mm -hmm. very quickly create this really professional looking PDF to send to them with all the information about the pieces. And then they were able to look at the piece and then determine as to whether or not um, they would want to possibly loan the work for an upcoming exhibition. And so it just is really quick and easy in terms of being able to share the information that we have with like smaller selections of works. That's great. Um, our next audience, uh, coming towards the end of the presentation, um, strengthening relationships with our donors, very important people, <laughs> and the allying with college advancement, also very important people for the longevity and sustainability of our collections. Um, so remembering the digital tools can help you build and strengthen relationships with your donors. Um, here's a contact record screenshot. Um, so you can log contact details, you know, what works or funds they have donated. You can stay on top of communication um, for, within Artwork Archive. If you send a private room or a report, you'll see that logged within the recently shared. So you're like, did I send? Yep, you did. If you're talking to a loaning institution, you know, you already sent them the inventory report. Um, and donors, what I've heard from uh, other academic institutions is they love to see their impact, right? So the artwork did not get donated and then just put into storage. Um, and it didn't just get hung up on the wall. Now it's online and like they know that students can engage with it. They're seeing their credit. Um, it's really exciting for them to quickly see the impact of their donation. And it also um, having everything stored within a database like Artwork Archive helps you communicate with your donors. Um, and so Marissa, you had a really great example about a professor Amaretis who is donating a lot of works. Yes, we've got a several uh, <laughs> professor emeritus who are much beloved in the community, one of them being a student studio. Our professor who was here for just decades and decades was very prolific, is very prolific, is still living. Um, and, you know, we already have over 70 works by this artist in the collection, his print work and his paintings. And so we had a donor come to us with another, you know, not, not 70 works, but a, a good chunk of works by this particular artist. Um, and it was really easy for us to do the research of, well, do we want to accept this? Should we accept it? Because we could just pull up that artist's name, see all the works we had by him, um, and like compare and contrast and realize that most of what this artist, this other, other donor wanted to donate were prints that we already had. So we already had that series in the collection. So you can then, we could then print that out, show it to a potential donor or, or a donor coming to us and be like, we appreciate it, but we have to respectfully decline because we already have this. So it's not just that blow off of, we're sorry, we can't accept this. We don't have the room. We already have the artists in the collection. You can give this tangible thing of like, this is what we have. This is what we do. They see, you know, our capacity of, of caring for work and then also cataloging the work and making it accessible through this, through this way. So it helped us, you know, kind of show what we could do to this donor, but then, you know, Advancement of Development Office already then also sees how they can use our database to help mm -hmm. it as well. You know, they've got, this is not just something that's just for us to see. Anybody could go in and see how many works we have by X artist and what we're doing to have it on view, whether it's in storage, out on campus, excuse me, everything like that. So it really is just a kind of a very, um, streamline way to to show what we have and then to get that information again out there in a professional clean looking manner that it's not you know you trying to make all your thumbnails like line up and be okay in an illustrated checklist it's yeah. just right there with you know a button 
Yeah, and I, I I wrote an article a long time ago with the help of um, some AAMG um, uh, colleagues about um, whether is a gift um, is a gift truly a gift or going to be a burden, right? And so sometimes we um, be proper stewards of our collections and caretakers. We have to have those uncomfortable. Well, they may be uncomfortable for many of us uh, conversations of saying no, and so having the information to show, having something tangible. Um, being very helpful, and then also to equip the college advancement team, which may be having those initial conversations with information so you don't get down the road into a sticky situation. Courtney, did you have something to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's been really helpful to us kind of at the beginning stages of donor conversations as well, if they maybe have a really large collection of artwork and they're not really sure what's in their collection and whether or not their collection would fit with us, um, our collection, if they're interested in donating, we're able to share kind of what we have and see as to whether or not they're, um, the works that they're interested in donating, donating really fit into our collection as well as fit into our current, you know, missions in terms of who we're kind of prioritizing collecting um, for the future. I also, um, I think of our Retablo collection again, and one of the um, trademarks of our Retablo collection is that a lot of them are saint paintings. And so a lot of them are quite literally replicas of the same image over and over again. So it's a little bit different for that collection in terms of what we're looking for. And so when we have people come to us with large Retablo collections, it also is really helpful to be able to call together how many um, you know, paintings of Our Lady of Refuge we have, how many paintings of the crucifixion we have. So that way we can kind of see if it's building in an area that we're lacking or if it's building in an area that we maybe already have 300 Our Lady of Refuge and maybe we don't need this collection in terms of our storage and our capacity to care for it. Yeah, no, really great point. And actually that gets to the streamlines over to the, the next point about, um, you know, uh, loaning institutions, right? So uh, maybe if you are going to uh, have a loan for the Retablo collection, um, you know, many of our institutions, we are bringing loans in, we are um, sending our works out. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time um, talking about how do we best communicate um, and engage with our loaning partners that we have. And so a lot of actually what we spoke about earlier coalesce into this slide, right? Of, you know, having everything organized in one place, being able to send out information in a private realm of these are the works, um, here um, is more information, um, being able to preserve that communication, having the loaning institution in your archive, because if there um, is a transition within the museum, someone leaves, someone can come in and pick it right back up, right? And see what was done in the past, what is coming up in the future. Um, do any of you have anything to add when it comes to engaging with loans? Um, I mean, I think that it's just, like you said, I mean, it's so helpful to have all of um, th that information in one um, location for us. Um, and in terms of, it kind of all serves a, a, pur a greater purpose where we have these online exhibitions, but then when we click on a piece, we're also able to access its condition report from when it came in, the intake photos that maybe aren't accessible to the public, but are accessible on our side, um, you know, the dates of when it came in, um, any type of insurance information, it's all right there. And it makes it so much simpler, um, especially because because our staff is so um, small, everyone's doing multiple tasks. And so um, while I might be doing the condition reports and intake photos, our coordinator is handling all of the shipping logistics and the insurance memos. And so being able to have one general place that we can all go to and access the information really helps things move smoother in regards to even our staff and how we communicate with each other. Love that. Okay, we're coming towards the end. Thank you for everyone for sticking with us. <laughs> uh, last but not least, so we, we cover a lot of different types of audiences, but there's just the, the people out there, whether they're in your town, um, in another country, um, are additional communities. And so one great thing about bringing your collection online, having it on a website, um, if, if you're using Artwork Archive, having a public profile, um, is that you are driving discoverability, awareness, you are promoting your collection um, beyond your, your gallery walls. And this is actually, um, Courtney, um, I think it might have been, Marissa that said it, you, but 
within yeah. a week of bringing your collection online, I'm going to read your words <laughs> with the public profile, which is shown here, but you saw a sudden increase of traffic to your website and no other variables changed. Yeah. And, and it was something that we um, immediately noticed and we were able to track it to Artwork Archive. And I think that that has been kind of really invaluable for us, um, especially because a lot of our missions moving forward are to promote our um, accessibility for our collection, both for our NMSU students and our faculty, but really for our community and for scholars and to encourage scholars to come to our, you know, our area in terms of being able to um, easily research and study from our collection. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll bring up the Lilly Museum of Art again, they're in Reno, and it's not necessarily a place that many people come to, but people are uh, finding them and learning more about their works and engaging with them. Um, the Marjorie uh, Barrick Museum of Art also told me that, you know, when someone is uh, researching an artist that was in one of their participate that was participating in one of their exhibitions or that is in their collection, if I were to Google search that artist, then the Barrick would show up. Um, because they're in the public profile. And so thus I have now learned about the, the barrack if I did not know about them. So, I mean, we are we are beholden to our, our internal groups, right? Like we, those are, you know, first and foremost, our communities, but, you know, there's only just so much good when we can market and promote ourselves. And then one other little piece is, um, if you didn't know, within Artwork Archive, if you are making your locations public, you can have an interactive map um, which is great because this is wonderful for prospective students, alumni that are coming back, current students and faculty and staff, they may not know that you have artwork strewn all around campus, or they may not, the history major may not go into the science wing. Um, and so, you know, showing the spread of your collection and helping people engage with it is um, also a, a really helpful, wonderful tool. Um, I made a joke earlier, we're all academics. I love reading I like my books and books and books in my bookshelf. So here are some articles that hit upon the topics that we discussed today. Uh, when we send out the slides, these are hyperlinked to our blog, which um, I also have a link to. Uh, so if you wanna continue the, the scholarship and the understanding, we have a lot of articles about maintenance and um, exhibitions and interactive maps, whatever it may be. And we have, we're two minutes before time, we can run over a little for questions and we're just going to hit time. So um, does anyone have, well, first I'm going to say thank you. Thank you to Marissa and Courtney and thank you to everyone here on the webinar. But if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Happy to answer them. And I'm also going to leave uh, my email in the chat so that if you have any questions after this, um, there is a feature that you are interested in. If you are an Artwork Archive client and you want to learn more about something, um, if you're not and you want a demo uh, to see how to use these tools, if you want to talk to someone who works within the museum or gallery, we have Marissa and Courtney. <laughs> I think one of the fun things um, about my job is that, you know, academic institutions are just one, one piece of the puzzle. Um, it's one that's near and dear to me because my dad's been a provost, my sister is a professor. Um, but, um, you know, I also work with public art programs, hospitals, uh, collecting institutions of all types. And so it's really lovely to learn from the best practices of all these different types of institutions. And we can learn about how we are engaging our communities and audiences with digital tools. Is everyone's brains about to explode because students just came back on campus? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> on the public facing, thank you, Travis. On the public facing side of online exhibitions or something you use in gallery, does the tool track user interactions click? We're trying to track data on things our patrons interact with, with on site. I just read that really quickly. I'm getting tongue tied. That's a really great question, Travis. And that's why we have website embeds. Um, and so I didn't include this slide, but What's great about reporting, and you guys can jump into this if you want, but um, using Google Analytics, you can track um, what people are clicking, who's clicking it, so you can gather demographic information. Are they from your area? How many repeat visitors do you have? How long are they staying on the exhibition? The duration of clicks, you know, what's the bounce rate? And Rissa, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've been able to really kind of track that too, and whether it's the student curated exhibitions that they're kind of clicking on, or are they clicking on, you know, just particular works, um, 
works that are coming into the collection new or um, and we can see just also if the students are really doing what their uh, instructors have asked them to do and really kind of come into the collection and start really looking at things, um, we can kind of see all of that. Yeah, that's that's great. And then um, uh, I believe it's included in the resources link, but when Winter Park, um, the Albin Polacek Museum in Winter Park, um, contributed to an article and they talked about reporting and the importance of documenting clicks rather than footprints during COVID uh, to report back on grants and funding to show their impact and how they are engaging with their audiences. And one other thing they looked at is when they send to the exhibitions and newsletters, open rate, click through rates, right? Um, and so there, there is data to be, to be had and we just have to think a little creatively or differently when using technology. But Google Analytics is great. Um, it's it's a weed. It's a mess. Um, there's a lot of great help docs to figure out what you need, but a great way to track traffic. Any other questions? All right. Well, you have access to us. We in, included our, our emails. Again, this presentation was recorded and early next week you'll receive the recording along with the slides that have the hyperlinks. Um, uh, we also have our blog. We have a webinars landing page. I, for better or for worse, you may have been hearing from me quite often <laughs> because I give a lot of these presentations. Um, we really wanna help advance uh, the wor work that you all are doing, making cultural heritage, the arch more accessible, especially for students. Uh, so thank you for all the work that you're doing. Good luck with the start of school. And thank you again to Marissa and Courtney for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone, enjoy your day. Bye. Bye.